Excellent. Good morning. This is Avi Uniglick, your tech concierge. And every Sunday we do a tech talk around uh, 11 a.m. We got detained a little bit with some uh, technical difficulties, but we're on now. And uh, I'm very, very happy to have my guest and friend and longtime colleague, Rick Albano, to the, I guess that would be to the left of me. Uh, on your screen, you're over on the right. I'm not sure. This is always confusing. But uh, <laughs> Rick, how are you doing this morning? Uh, I'm doing fantastic, Avi. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm glad that we could do this. And uh, my teleworker, I'm, I'm more than happy to have you uh, engage in here uh, if you'd like to jump in, ask any questions. But uh, the, the gist of this particular uh, context today is HIPAA. And we're going to do a little strategy session because Rick You've been in the healthcare and IT industry for as long as I have in the IT consulting industry. And uh, tell me a little bit about that. How long has that been? I really got started back in 1985. But even before that, I was in records management with, the, uh, with working with medical offices. So I've been in the game for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just from an IT standpoint, but I also got very heavily involved with management. I've actually managed offices. I ran a neurosurgery practice for a number of years. Uh, so I have a pretty good overview of the entire uh, industry f from a small to mid-sized practice standpoint. Excellent. That's that gives you a good background and a good uh, feel for what might be happening in a lot of the smaller offices, for sure. Exactly. And, uh, that's interesting. So uh, the first thing I want to do for a lot of people, they have no idea what HIPAA is, you know, other than so an animal that they might see in the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, HIPAA, my understanding is HIPAA stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. Now, 1996 was a long time ago. It was. And, and suddenly it's uh, an interesting topic once again. So uh, what exactly is HIPAA stat in relationship to the HIPAA accountability uh, rules? Well, HIPAA stat is our program that we put together over the years to help get offices up to compliance and become more aware of their responsibilities under the HIPAA laws and trying to do it in the most friendly and simple uh, to navigate way as possible. Because like any government legislation, HIPAA is very fraught with a lot of language that people don't understand. They don't understand the practical implications of what HIPAA means to them. And that's what we try to do to them. We try to help bring them in and help them get up and running with these uh, government regulations and have a good practical understanding of what they need to do in their office in order to maintain uh, compliance with the government laws. So HIPAA, as you said, has been around since 1996. The first implementation of HIPAA uh, <clears throat> that from a practical standpoint was in the early 2000s. Uh, but even that, it never really took hold. Uh, in the early 2000s, the practices basically started using uh, a HIPAA form that new patients would sign. And it was notice of their privacy practices, basically letting them know what the practice was doing to maintain compliance with the HIPAA rules. But it never really became more than that for most practices. People didn't really have a good understanding and the government wasn't really doing that much about enforcing HIPAA. Mostly it was civil penalties. So in other words, if your privacy was compromised by a negligent practice, uh, you could, and you had financial damages, you could actually sue the practice for those financial damages. But in reality, that never really took place. So HIPAA was basically toothless at that point. So there was a, a major sea change in 2013, September 23rd, 2013. A new regulation went into effect called the Omnibus Rule. And the Omnibus Rule was a real game changer because what that did, it, it created penalties for practices that violate patient privacy. And the practices are faced with pretty substantial penalties, anywhere from between $100 per patient per incident, all the way up to $50,000 per patient per incident with a cap of $2 million per incident. So a $2 million fine to a big health insurer is not going to really ruin their day. But for a small to mid-sized practice, obviously, uh, that could be a real uh, life-changing experience. 
and the responsibility levels are equal across the whole playing field. So no matter how large you are or how small you are, you still have the same culpability and responsibility, I guess a fiduciary responsibility to the patient and to the patient record. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, and the big hospitals, the large medical practices, uh, the healthcare insurance companies, et cetera, the large corporations are really on top of HIPAA. They have their own HIPAA teams. Uh, most hospitals are doing a very good job of doing it. But again, it's lost on the small to mid-sized practices in our experience. Now, so, do insurance companies fall under the same guidelines or are they not? Absolutely. Yeah, they do. Anybody whose direct business is healthcare is covered by, is, is, you know, affected by HIPAA. And anybody who comes in direct contact with a patient record is what they call a covered entity if their primary business is healthcare. So you could be a doctor, or a hospital, a medical group, a healthcare insurance company. You are all considered covered entities. You are primary responsibility for HIPAA and maintaining privacy and compliance. So we just heard about the upstate New York uh, Blue Cross uh, that got hit with uh, a 10 million, uh, quote, subscriber exposure. Mm -hmm. And this has been going on for a couple of years. They just recognized it back in August and uh, quite, quite an exposure there. Uh, they're claiming that, you know, the records were exposed. They don't know to what extent there's been any physical breaches or or, you know, laws broken with regard to the actual patient records or information, but they're investigating that pretty thoroughly right now. The FBI is involved and, uh, you know, it's, it's quite, quite an ordeal. And again, if a, a firm, th th the point here is if a firm that large can be exposed, imagine how vulnerable many small offices and individual practitioners are when they're not uh, capable of, of the expense that's uh, required to, to maintain and support a, an infrastructure like, like that? Well, a small to mid-sized medical practice is, for all intents and purposes, a small business. Yeah. And small businesses don't have the resources uh, internally to maintain these compliances. I mean, these large corporations, if they have to hire a dozen people to uh, manage their compliance, that's not a big deal to them. That's just another expense. But a medical office or a chiropractic office, podiatry office, whatever the case may be, uh, less than five providers, let's say, they don't have the resources to dedicate a full-time personnel for maintaining their HIPAA compliance. They don't even know where to begin in order to create a HIPAA compliance program. And that's where we kind of step in and help them. Now, how long have you had your HIPAA stat uh, in effect? We've been doing it since 2002. Uh, wow. That was the first uh, incarnation of HIPAA. We started providing manual and consulting services back then. But again, the the sea change was in 2013, September 23rd, when the omnibus rule went into effect, because now the potential p penalties are so much more, uh, so much more severe and life altering, especially to the smaller practices. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, what? Tell me more about HIPAA in, in terms of meaningful use. How does, how does that get involved uh, with the practice itself? Uh, and again, it, there's a lot of moving pieces here, and they're all interrelated. And the real reason behind HIPAA is not privacy. There's two, two mistakes that people make with HIPAA. One is they think that it's spelled H-I-P-P-A. Uh, yeah. that, I see that even on professional websites, they misspell it. It's actually H-I-P-A-A, -A, uh, the healthcare information Portability and Accountability Act. And the first day is, the, that's the catch there, that accountability. They want to make, the whole guys behind, uh, the reason behind HIPAA is they want to make sure that practices share information seamlessly. They're trying to use technology so physicians can share information. They're not, they're going to ultimately help control costs because they're not going to rerun tests that have already been run. Uh, the healthcare puzzle nowadays is much different than it was when we were born. Uh, back then, you saw one doctor who handled everything for you. Now it's become specialties and subspecialties. And because of that fragmentation, there's a real need for them to share information as seamlessly as possible. And they're looking for technology to fill that gap, to be the conduit so they can tie all this information together. And we're still not there yet, but we're well on the road. And the Government realized at that point that if we're going to have all this information flowing around, we need to make darn sure that it's protected. 
because people can steal that information just like they can steal your information to open up credit cards or to open up a, a, a loan, take out a loan in your name. Uh, we're all aware of the advertisements on TV for companies like Lifeguard and uh, and the like. Life, will help LifeLock. Yeah. LifeLock, life, life, life mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. So here's some interesting thing. If you want to take a look into the criminal mind, the people that are actually stealing this information, generally the people that steal your personal information aren't the ones that are going to turn around and take out a loan in your name or open up a credit card in your name. They sell it on the black market. Absolutely. The people buy, buy it on the black market, and then they use your information that they purchased on that black market to open up a credit card or take out a loan in your name. Now, the interesting thing is that your personal information – something that could ruin your life because someone ruins your credit because they stole your identity on that black market is worth around $10. Not a lot of money, no. but, uh, especially in comparison to the amount of damage that can be done. But the interesting thing is your healthcare identity, things that can be used to file false claims under your name is worth around $50 per person on that black market. And there's a real good reason why. Generally, if someone takes out a credit card in your name or takes out a loan, most people, not everyone, but most people will discover that breach within 30 days or two billing cycles at least, and they'll put an end to it. Sure. However, with your healthcare information, they can file false claims under your name over and over and over again, and most people won't even realize that it's happening. You'll get what's called the, your explanation of benefits in the mail. But if you're, uh, and you, you might be able to see if you're diligent and read through these EOBs and see, oh, wow, I didn't have this procedure done or I never saw this doctor. And then you would turn around and report it. But truth be told, if no one's bugging you for a copay and demanding you that you pay for a part of that visit, most people are going to ignore it. And because of that, they can go on and on over and over again, month after month, sometimes year after year, file, filing false claims in your name and collecting tens of thousands of dollars from your health insurance carrier. And you are none the wiser. Now, what's even worse is we're all trying to control the cost of health care. And so ultimately, we're all paying for those data breaches. Sure. sure. And it's a much larger problem than most people are even talking about. Uh, I've read some statistics that said as many as 10% of all healthcare claims are fraudulent. That's a, that's a big number. Well, you're looking at when you translate that into dollars and cents, you're talking between 50 and 100 billion with a B yeah. dollars a year into false claims. Now, they're not all done by criminals. Sometimes it's doctors who are coding improperly, charging mm -hmm. more than they should, saying this service or this office is, it was more involved than it really was. And because of that, uh, that, that's all rolled into that, you know, 50 to $100 billion mark. But still, when you look at it, it's a huge problem. Absolutely. Yeah, there's big numbers and big liability involved. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what the government is trying to do. A lot of doctors fall back into a mode where they feel it's a persecution process. Why is the government bugging me? I'm just trying to practice medicine here. But it really goes beyond that. It's they're trying to control the cost of health care. And this is an easy way for them to control the cost of health care without denying services to people that might need it, without making doctors' lives that much more difficult. If we're going to make anybody's life difficult by controlling and containing uh, health care fraud, it's going to be by going after the criminals. And I'd sure. rather that my 10 percent of my health care dollar not be going, you know, I'd rather that, that money be going to me for additional services that I can benefit from or paying my practitioners who are providing me with those services rather than going to some anonymous, uh, anonymous criminal somewhere in Eastern Europe. Absolutely. So tell me again, what is the omnibus rule and how does it apply here? Well, the omnibus rule really stepped up the game for HIPAA, but the most important thing is the omnibus rule is saying that there are now mandatory penalties when a covered entity such as a doctor or a health insurance company or a testing lab or anybody who is a primary provider of healthcare services violates either intentionally or through negligence uh, a patient's privacy. So what's the best way for a small firm to absolutely help themselves and utilize your risk analysis, the HIPAA STAT program? How does that actually work for them? 
Well, what happened was because the government is making this big push for this interoperability and portability of patients' healthcare information, they came out with an incentive program called High Tech a few years back, and they're paying physicians and hospitals, et cetera, for using electronic healthcare records. And most patients have noticed when they're going to a doctor, most doctors now are using a computer to record their healthcare information and they're no longer using paper charts for the most part. Yeah, And then the reason why there's such a wide ad ad adaptation of that is because the government paid them a lot of money for doing that. But in order, they're not just getting a, a check or checks over the years for buying software for doing it. They have to prove that they're using it and they're using it to good effect. And that good effect is what the government calls meaningful use. So these are different watermarks, uh, different touch points they have to meet and do on a daily basis with their electronic health care records. Uh, so the government would consider it to be meaningful use. And part of that meaningful use, and this makes sense, they circle back to HIPAA and the omnibus rule, and they want to make sure that they do everything they can to secure and uh, protect the patient's electronic health records. They're paying something like $20 billion over the last four years to get physicians to make their patients' records electronic. And because of that, they also want to make sure that they're taking good care of these records. So they go through a process with you in identifying the potential areas that they have covered as well as the areas of weakness that they need to improve on. Is that Absolutely. true? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's not just because of uh, with their electronic records. It also has to do with a lot of practical, <coughs> excuse me, practical implications in the process and the practice. I mean, even though everybody's going to electronic records, there's still paper records everywhere in the office, and they need to protect those. There's also ways that staff needs to act. They have to be very careful about identifying patients because all it takes is a little crack in the dam for a, a, a persistent and diligent criminal to extract patient records. So even your name is protected health information, something that a doctor's office, for example, can't expose. So they really shouldn't even, when they're summoning a patient from the waiting room, they shouldn't even use the patient's full name. If you were a patient and I was a physician, I was summoning you, you're in my waiting room, I can call you Avi, I can call you Mr. Uniglick. I shouldn't refer to you as Avi Uniglick. How and about I, those sign-in sheets, Rick, that uh, many, many doctors have used over the years? They're, they're really not in compliance, are they? Not in my opinion. I think that they are not in compliance. Um, there are some people that will argue otherwise. Uh, however, my standard response is you're looking at these fines, again, anywhere from $100,000 to $50,000 per patient. Do you really want to roll those dice? And I say no. It's easier to uh, make sure that you keep as private as possible. And uh, if it means using a different type of sign-in sheet and there's different mechanisms that you can use that will protect uh, exposure and you can still maintain a sign-in sheet, why not use them? Why take a chance? Even if it costs you $100 more in supply every year to keep a private sign-in sheet, it's well worth, it's cheap insurance. Welcome, so, Marcia. I'm, I'm glad you joined us today. We're talking about uh, how the HIPAA rules and uh, compliance is necessary for medical practitioners as well as uh, any health care providers. And uh, I'm glad you're here with us today. Uh, if you have any questions along the lines uh, of what we're going to be talking about or have talked about, I welcome you to, to jump in and we'll certainly uh, be happy to speak with you. Or if you just want to stay uh, in, the, in the chat area, certainly you can uh, hit slash Q and that will bring up a question uh, banner that we'll be able to identify readily and we'll be happy to help you. So Rick and I have been discussing the uh, HIPAA Act of 1996 and how it relates to all different type of entities uh, that are uh, dealing with and required to, to respond uh, in the healthcare field. And, you know, there, there's a lot of overlap, Rick, between a business in general in how they have to secure their information and what they should do uh, and, and the medical community. The difference is the fines and how they uh, are obligated as a fiduciary to, to maintain this information uh, with, without, you know, uh, the, the need to uh, 
in a, in a normal business that doesn't have to deal with that type of information, they're not required to do that. So, uh, you know, let's say, for example, a car dealership has very similar information when they take in a credit app. They have people's uh, social security numbers, credit information, and they warehouse that in, in, a, in a business environment. The difference is there's no health related information tied to that. Correct. Right. So. Uh, but just the fact that any component of that, similarly, if a healthcare provider were to release a name and social security number from their system and not monitor it properly and track where it's going and who's seen it and who has their eyeballs on it, similarly, they're exposed while a normal business isn't. It's an interesting concept, isn't it? It is. And the other thing that's interesting is that this responsibility can be borne by the other party so that if I'm a covered entity, such as a doctor, I'm covered directly by the HIPAA laws, I can share information with, let's say, Blue Cross and Blue Shield because they're also a covered entity and we're dealing with the same patient. So we can share that information freely, but we're both responsible for maintaining the privacy and the security of that data. Now, there's other types of people that a doctor's office would share information with. Uh, one of the big is what's called uh, big ones is what are called business associates. Yes. And a business associate is someone whose business is not primarily healthcare, but they work with healthcare entities. And in course of conducting their business, they are going to come into contact with what they call PHI, protected health information, patient identifiers. A good example is uh, your business. When you walk into a doctor's office to work on their computers, uh, you're going to incidentally come into contact or you have the potential of coming into contact with protected health information because Absolutely. you might be looking at their database tables or spreadsheets or just information laying around on a doctor's office desk that you know a paper chart or list of patients or what have you yes. so you are what's called a business associate of the practice and what the doctors need to do what the practices need to do is to make sure they have a contract with you where you agree that you are aware of the HIPAA requirements and you agree to take uh, take them into your care and not to violate the, the, the privacy of the patient data that you come into contact with. And by having that contract, it takes the responsibility, the onus off the practice and puts it onto you. Sure. So yeah. now the, the issue is, is that if they don't have this contract signed with you and you breach the data, perhaps even accidentally, they bear the full responsibility for your breach because they didn't have this business associate agreement with you. And that's something that, you know, one of the many things that we do is set them up with a proper business associate agreement and get them uh, to, to get any vendor, anybody that would come into contact with their data that's not a primary covered entity. Uh, such as their IT people, that's the big one, but it also could be their delivery people, the person dropping off the water cooler. Uh, so it, it's anybody that comes into a non-public part of their office is a potential uh, source of a data breach, incidental, uh, purposeful, or accidental. So you need to take the onus off of you, off of the practice, and put it onto that third party, that business associate. Sure. I mean, and there are areas that offices don't always think about. For example, the copier vendor who exactly. comes in who comes in and replaces their copy machine, which has a hard drive in it, and they've been copying patient records on that hard drive. And if they don't monitor where that hard drive is, you know, most of our patients are, or clients that are in the medical area have that hard drive removed from the copy machine, and either it's destroyed or they maintain that so that they do not let it out of their office when the copy machine leaves. Yeah, and the way that we address things, that's an ex excellent example, and it's one that where a lot of offices fall short because they just don't realize it. Right. And so what we do is part of the risk analysis, we look at their imaging equipment, we determine whether or not it has any non-volatile storage, such as a hard drive, and then we make sure that they're educated on it, and they have a policy that, that those hard drives are removed and destroyed when that equipment is surrendered. Uh, very often these big machines by Rico or Canon or whomever uh, aren't purchased by the practice, they're leased. Yes. And they return them at the end of a three or three year lease, not realizing that almost everything that they ever scanned, copied, or uh, faxed is stored on that machine. There's a video on our website that uh, 
shows an incident. I think it was 60 Minutes did uh, an expose of a copier warehouse. Yes, I've seen that. Jersey. Yeah, sure. And they purchased 10 used copiers, and three of them had healthcare information on it. Some of it quite extensive. And it's not that the people did anything wrong from the standpoint. They weren't nefarious and said, oh, I don't care. They just didn't know better. That's right. And there's more and more areas of technology that are being implemented in healthcare practices that have potential breaches, potential leaks, such as those copier machines, that people don't even think about. There's a lot of diagnostic equipment. There's a lot of therapy equipment that records patient names and statistics, uh, test results, et cetera. And all those machines need to be protected because someone can take information off of one of those machines. And if it's not something that we can encrypt or password protect, we need le we at least need to physically secure those machines. Security cameras in, in offices that record patient faces and information, you know, they well, have privacy rules. Right. No, I'm talking more about we need to tether them. We need to somehow either put them in a locked room when the office is closed or we need to put a security tether on them so no one can do a grab and run. Right. And I, I always give the example. It, there's two doctors. They both buy a brand new Porsche convertible. The first one it keeps the top up, keeps the door locked, keeps the alarm on, stores that car in a locked garage when he's not driving it. The second one leaves it with the top down and the keys in the ignition in Center City, Philadelphia in the middle of the day. Both of those doctors have their new Porsche convertible stolen. The first one who did everything they could within practicality and within reason to protect that convertible, they are clearly a victim of a crime. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The second doctor is just negligent. Mm -hmm. And if you look at patient data as being that Porsche convertible, you want to make sure that if something does happen, you are identified clearly as being a victim of a crime. So you're just doing everything within possibility, within reason, to protect that data. That's a you perfect example. That's yeah, you excellent. can't be cavalier about it. That's excellent. And it, but the technology, and this, as you know, technology is constantly changing, and uh, we're always updating our manuals accordingly. There's a very interesting thing there's a, 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 a potential data breach that we identified and that we're now including in our training and our risk analysis and in in our uh, our, our hipaa manuals that we produce for the practices uh, most offices now when you're sitting in the waiting room there's a tv there very very mm -hmm. common yeah. and usually they're a nice big lcd that's mounted to a wall and very often they're provided by one of the vendors that are selling a product or a service to the doctors and they have little infomercials in there and, and it's, it's, it's all a good thing this way you can watch good morning america while you're waiting to see the doctor and maybe there be, might be in a, you know a, a drug commercial interlaced in there or what have you there's nothing wrong with that except that a lot of new tvs are what are called smart tvs and they have actually an internet connection and the thing that people don't realize is that these smart TVs very often are programmed to listen to conversations that mm -hmm. happen in front of them. Yeah. And then they're going offshore, which is now a major HIPAA violation because it's leaving the boundaries of the United States for collection and analysis. So having one of these smart TVs that is connected in the practice to the Internet is a very potential uh, potential for a, for a relatively large HIPAA violation. Now, there's ways that you can do work around that. You could, uh, first thing, when you first fire up a TV, you don't want to agree to the end user license agreement that pops up on the screen because that gives, by clicking on that, and no one ever reads those license agreements, no. by clicking on that, you're giving them permission for recording the information, sure. which is fine if that TV is sitting in your living room at home because it's up to you. But your patients are not giving their permission to have their information. Your patients may be discussing amongst themselves their private health care information. Uh, and it's okay. I'm willing to disclose my information to the patient sitting next to me, but I'm not willing to disclose it. I'm not, get, I'm not giving my permission to share it with Samsung's data center over <laughs> Korea. It's, it's a, cool. Yeah. So this is something that we say, if you have a smart TV, disconnect it. Uh, if you are going to have it connected to the internet, make sure that you don't agree to the end user license agreement. And at the very least, make sure that you have a, a business associate agreement signed with whoever is monitoring that data. Sure. Well, it even goes as to the lengths of a patient walking in with a smartphone that has a camera on it. 
Mm -hmm. And they have exposure there to be able to duplicate information that they have or record conversations, whatnot, and pass that out of the office as well. Well, that's okay so, if the patient is doing it for their own purposes. For their own, but because how about I if I can voluntarily disclose my information. Sure. You, as my provider that I'm giving the information to, cannot do that unless it's for certain predefined purposes, which, again, are all defined by HIPAA. So there's only certain reasons why you can share my information with another third party. Right. But if I walk in as a patient and I have my camera open, let's say I'm doing a blab or I'm doing some type of uh, periscope in an office and I just happen to you know, casually walk in there and I pick up some faces and some conversations without permission mm -hmm. and that gets broadcast, that gets broadcast out, I, I have an issue. That's why you'll often see no cell phones allowed in this practice. Please turn your cell phones off. Absolutely. And you actually gave me a good idea. I think that's something that we're going to add to our next manual. Really, yeah. That's a very yeah. good point There's, about the cell phone because again it's that exposure and again are, is it going to stop patients from doing that no but it's putting the onus on them exactly notice one thing that we do we provide signage that says this area contains private medical records yes unauthorized personnel not allowed mm -hmm. so that way someone you're not going to stop someone from walking into a private part of the walking into a file room for example and seeing the names of the charts and what have you but you can put them on notice and say hey the responsibility is on you as the patient who's been forewarned and not on me. Absolutely. And then, of course, you have the employees of a practice who may want to take some work home with them. And they take a laptop and put it in their car. Mm -hmm. They drive home with it. Something happens to the laptop. They're exposed. We uh, talk, we talk about it, encryption. We talk about remote access to the office, things of that nature. But, you know, even as small as just taking a flash drive and putting it in your pocket with some data that's on it without the proper precautions that you're you're exposing your practice to some tremendous liability absolutely and there's ways around that and that's why uh slowly but surely the medical community is moving to cloud-based computing because that way they put the data into you know basically the equivalent of a fort knox and they can only access it using proper passwords and, and what have you. So you never have that information on your laptop or on your smartphone. You're just using your laptop, your smartphone, your home PC to access the information uh, elsewhere. We try to tell people don't take information off site. If you are taking a device off site that contains information, make sure that it's encrypted. Uh, because then if you, if I have a backup hard drive, I've been maintaining my own computer system and I have a backup hard drive, I want to make sure that hard drive is encrypted if I ever take it off site. Because if I lose an encrypted drive, it's not a breach because people really can't read that drive unless they know the encryption key. However, if it's not encrypted and I lose it, then it's a major breach. There's also responsibilities under HIPAA and under the omnibus rule that I have to notify every patient that was involved. And I also have to offer them some type of remediation. Usually it's a year of free credit monitoring. But if you have a typical practice with five or 10,000 patient records that are on their hard drive, you start multiplying that by $50 for the, for the credit monitoring for every one of those patients. You know, we're talking, you know, half a million dollars just for that. And then you have the loss of good faith. You have patients that might leave your practice because they, you were exposed, because they were, their data was exposed by you. They might say, I'm not going to go back to this doctor because they're careless with, with my information. So it's, you know, it, 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 the whole path is fraught with peril, but Absolutely. you can't sweep it under the rug anymore. The new rule says you must report it. And God help the practice that has a breach like that and doesn't report it. And it's, the, it's the awareness factor. Uh, you know, Absolutely. You talk about uh, how practices have grown up using email and communicating with attorneys and outsiders mm -hmm. and not being aware of the exposure. Many people think that an email is secure, <laughs> you know, a standard email. And, and we know that not only does it never travel from point A to point B without anybody in between, but it travels from point A to point B unencrypted, jumps on many, many machines and servers and switches and all that data is identifiable all the way along the trail. Absolutely. And, and that, that's why a lot of practices are now moving to things called patient portals where they can communicate yes. with the patients electronically, but over a secure encrypted network. And people don't always appreciate the fact that their life is encumbered to the point where they need to do these extra steps 
but it's absolutely necessary if they want to be aware and they want to be uh, cognizant of the fact. You know, it's it's a lot easier to leave your Porsche unlocked and jump in and out of it. Right. But but you know, it's not it's, the, not it's not it's not good practice. It's not prudent. It's not a good practice. And so, this is again going back to what I started about talking about the uh, the exposure, the bad people that are stealing your data. They go to great extents writing spyware and viruses and what have you to get perhaps one person's identity that's worth ten dollars. Yeah. But if I can go and I can get into a, a medical practices computer system, I get into their, their SQL database where they have ten thousand patients' information, and those each one of those is worth fifty dollars. I hit the mother load. Just hit the jackpot. Exactly. Absolutely. So they, sure. That's why the doctors' practices, these healthcare practices, are a much larger target than they even realize. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So, is there any area that? Uh, you know, we haven't discussed today that would be important for a, a practice to understand other than you making sure that people know how to get in touch with you, Rick, because I want to make sure that they have your website uh, and uh, contact information. Well, the one thing that I always tell practices is, is that it's kind of like a game of tennis. And the trick of the game is keeping the ball on the other side of the net. And so basically, whenever possible, even though you have all this great responsibility and we're not asking you or telling you to be negligent, we're telling you to be diligent. But we're also saying that whenever possible, put the onus, the responsibility onto the other party. Sure. And so patients are very are, are the big probably the biggest breachers of private protected healthcare information are the patients themselves. But make sure that you have things in writing where the patients are accepting that responsibility. And that's all again with the contracts and the forms that we provide practices with. It helps to serve that purpose where the patients are taking their responsibility. You don't want a patient who takes data out of your office. They want a copy of their chart. And under the HIPAA laws, that's part of the portability portion of that, you have a responsibility to give patients their health care records. Very few exceptions, you know, mental health records, things like that. But for the most part, when a patient wants a copy of their chart, you have to provide it with them. But you want to make darn sure that the patient acknowledges that they're taking that chart and that they're taking responsibility for that chart. Because if someone else finds that chart blowing down Main Street 15 minutes later, you don't want them coming after you saying you were negligent by protecting these records. You want to have the capability of saying, hey, we just gave that chart to this patient and they just signed it over here. This is where they took responsibility for it. I know I've worked with you uh, and I continue to work with you technically in supporting encryption. Uh, one area we didn't discuss today is disaster recovery and the ability for a office to be able to access those records in the event there's a problem. Let's talk a little bit about that. That's actually a great point. I'm glad that you brought it up. Uh, when we talk about the security of records, it doesn't necessarily just mean that you're preventing them from uh, having hackers access them. It means that you know the government is paying these doctors a lot of money to go to electronic records, and they don't want to have the doctor say, oops, we goofed, we lost, our server crashed, and we lost all of these records. First of all, it's disastrous to the practice. It's disastrous to the patients. But more importantly, uh, we need to keep the government paid you a lot of money to co collect this data electronically. They want you to protect it from disaster and disaster recovery is like life insurance or your car insurance. You don't really think that much about it until there is a disaster. Um, a lot of times, you know, part of the risk analysis is we look at environmental factors. We say, hey, if you're, you know, 10 miles from a nuclear plant, for example, this is one of the things that we do. You need to have a clear evacuation plan. You need to have ways of protecting that data and bringing that data with you. Because if you're going to have a huge EMF pulse coming off of this plant uh, because there's a, 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 a meltdown and it's going to wipe out all your servers as a result, you want to make sure that you have that cop that data secured elsewhere. Uh, I'll give you a real practical example. I'm based out of New Jersey, uh, and when I was doing, you know, doing this consulting over the years and getting people to get on board with disaster recovery plans, what happens to your practice if the worst happens? A lot of them poo-pooed me. Ah, well, you know, the government's really sticking their nose in my business. Why do I need to do that? And then we had a little thing called Hurricane Sandy, and mm -hmm. we had a lot of practices whose offices and their records ended up out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And if they didn't have a disaster recovery plan in place, a secondary backup, a way of accessing their information after that disaster, uh, they came back to me and said, wow, thank goodness that you made me do that. 
because other than that, I would be out of practice. And there's certain types of practices that the information is more mission critical than others. If you're a cardiologist, if you're a brain surgeon, if you're someone who's where your data is, can make a life and death difference to a patient having access, timely access to that data, uh, you need to make sure that you have multiple ways of storing and remaining and giving access to that data in the event of an emergency. Absolutely. If you're, you're out of power and your office is flooded, it doesn't take away the responsibility of you to still have access to that data. Good point. Oliver, if you'd like to join us, uh, we have an open seat. Uh, happy to have you, you know, discuss your, uh, your point. I see where you said hosted ambulatory EHRs can really help with this since most physician practices don't have the IT expertise to really handle DR. Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. correct. And I said before, a little bit earlier, perhaps before he joined us, is that that's why a lot of practices are now moving to a cloud solution, because when it's in a cloud, the, 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 the cloud services provider, the people that are actually storing and running your software, have the ways and the, the knowledge to maintain the backups and to maintain, usually they have more than one facility, so that if their primary facility is impacted, uh, I work with the data center here in New Jersey that was dark for a week because they got flooded during Hurricane Sandy. They lost all their power. They had emergency generators, but those emergency generators only had 24 hours worth of fuel. And because the facility was flooded, they couldn't get fuel trucks in to, re to refill those generators. So luckily, they had a mirror site in Chicago where they were able to um, give people access to so they can maintain uh, uh, continuity of, of data. And it's also important, Rick, that the uh, practice do their homework and make sure that they're dealing with a company that's HIPAA compliant to begin with. I know uh, many choose to use inexpensive cloud backup solutions, even if they're not hosting. Mm -hmm. And those cloud backup solutions are not willing to sign a business associates agreement. They and, get there's, into a, and there's a reason for that. And this is why it sometimes... Yeah takes a little bit more money to have the proper cloud backup solution. Um, a lot of these companies use servers that are offshore. Offshore, for sure. And once yeah. data leaves the confines of the continental United States, Alaska, Canada, maybe Guam and the Marshall Islands, but once it leaves the United States, it's a HIPAA violation because yeah. the HIPAA laws can't reach beyond our borders. Yeah. So that's why the $2 a month cloud backup service isn't really a viable solution for a healthcare practice because most likely you and I know that's going offshore. And even if it's not, I've seen firms that stay in the in this country. Uh, however, they will not risk their own exposure by signing a business associates agreement. So they won't do it even though they may be quote compliant or capable of being compliant. They just won't go through the extents necessary to obligate themselves in a liable manner. And uh, that, that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. You know? And I have practices that come up to me and say, oh, they refuse to sign it. What do I do? And I say, find another provider That's who's correct. willing to do it. That's the only way you're going to change it. And the reason why they're refusing to sign it is because their lawyers, who are probably better than your lawyers, are telling them not to sign it. <laughs> sure. Because they, they appreciate the potential for, you know, breaches and what they the can cost that company. They know they can put that company out of business. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. Good. Is there anything we haven't talked about? I, I, I want you to make sure that people know how to reach you. They can check your profile here, uh, but we'll likely have this uh, available for replay and it may not have uh, contact information there. So obviously your handle's Rick underscore Albano on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, Follow me on Twitter. Are, and your website is? Systematics, S-Y-S-T-M-A-T-I-X online.com. Systematics online.com. Or you could also do the program that we put together, and this might be an easier URL to remember. Uh, we call our program HIPAAstat. So if you go to HIPAA, H-I-P-A-A dash S-T-A-T dot com, that will also redirect you to my website. I am also, you could also reach out to me personally at rickalbano at gmail.com. Excellent. Rick, I really appreciate you joining me today. It's very, for very me. informative. And uh, I look forward to working with you nearby in the future as we uh, roll these products out to uh, your clients and uh, in a supporting role. I love to help you. 
Fantastic. So thanks again. Always a pleasure. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, next week on Tech Talk, look for the scheduled Dub Lab. We'll be doing that. And remember, on Thursday evenings, we do a Periscope at 8 p.m. And I very much look forward to doing uh, another conversation there. We'll, we'll probably be looking at some of the new uh, techniques that we have available to us on Periscope and the new uh, new iPhone app. So let's uh, have a great week and wish you all well. Thanks again. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.